so much for joining our webinar this afternoon in the UK with Katie Frost and Lucy Sofronio, who are going to be delivering a session focusing on well-being. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write them in the chat box and we will do our best to answer your questions. I'll pass it over to Katie and Lucy now. Thank you. Thank you and a very warm welcome to you all. And I can see already that in the chat, you're doing exactly what I wanted you to do. How did you know? Yeah. Greetings from India and Brazil and Bolivia and Jamaica and keep them coming, please. It's really good to know where you're all from. I'm sitting here in a very sort of a uh, uh, wet kind of UK. Oh, San Lucia. Oh, my good. Argentina, Belize, South Africa, Hertfordshire. You're near me. OK. In Oh, Mexico. Wow. Fantastic. Well, that's brilliant. Wherever you are in the world right now, we are all facing multiple layers of challenge. And while we're in the same storm with this pandemic, you know, we are on different boats and we really appreciate that. We've all of us got our own unique situations to manage both at work and at home. And many of us have families and friends to take care of, commitments in our own communities and caring responsibilities of our own. Now, as professionals in education, you're doing a lot of giving and have a hugely positive influence with all the people that you come into contact with in your communities and beyond. So this webinar is an invitation to you to start with you, to support you in putting your own mask on first, keep your own well-being in place as you navigate this pandemic. We're going to be looking at practical tools and approaches to maintain your well-being, reviewing the barriers in looking after our own health and how to overcome them. Lucy, tell them some more. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Wherever you are in the world, thanks for joining us today. Our well-being really is the foundation on which everything else happens. And during turbulent times, our well-being can take a backseat and it can do in normal life, too. So this webinar is an invitation to accept the present moment and your feelings about it and to shift our perspective of seemingly negative experiences, whether they are in relation to the pandemic, events that predate the pandemic or even challenges yet to come and use them as a means for positive change. You will be emailed the slides and additional resources. Resources, and the webinar itself will be uploaded onto YouTube. So sit back and enjoy. All you need is a pencil or a pen, something to write on, a good cup of tea or coffee. I have a coffee here and we will begin. I'll now hand over to Katie who will explore what we're finding more challenging in the current context. Thank you, Lucy. OK, so, yeah, I wonder how these challenges resonate with you and how you're finding things on your boat at the moment. Now, many of us are finding ourselves feeling more tired and having less energy. Maybe that resonates with you. We're kind of getting quite battle weary now as the pandemic has been going on. And one of the reasons could be we're having to work harder at managing our own emotions, emotions of fear, perhaps sadness, frustration, as we deal with uncertainty and radical change. It's hard to plan anything, for example. We may be finding an increasing demand to meet the needs of others, perhaps parents, children, colleagues, family members because of the pandemic. As the pandemic has dragged on, many of us are finding it harder to really keep being motivated and keep boredom from the door. So the demands of work and trying to balance these with our home lives is challenging and stressful. And sometimes we can feel guilty when we're working because perhaps family members are losing out and guilty if we don't. Some of us are also experiencing a real sense of loss not seeing friends and family, being able to meet and chat to colleagues, and tragically, others' grief. And sometimes we can simply feel overwhelmed with the work we need to do, battle to get it done because of our own circumstances, and worry it isn't our usual standard. And then guess what? We begin to lose confidence. So you can really see how many of these challenges have a psychological impact 
and that you may be experiencing this yourself or observe it in colleagues. And it is normal. They are normal responses to adversity. It is not normal to feel OK. It's more dangerous not to acknowledge this. We none of us are fine, at least not in parts of the day or parts of the week. Most of us experience fear and frustration, exhaustion, sadness and guilt. So it can be really helpful to keep an eye on our well-being by giving ourselves a little rating each day. We can just simply think, OK, on a scale of one to ten, one being low and ten being high, how would I rate my well-being today? And I'd like you to do that now and show us in the chat. Where is your well-being at today? One being low, ten being high. So we've got some numbers already coming in. Seven, that's a that's you're clearly doing some things and really looking after yourself. And you know, other people in a different place today, perhaps lower than that. I know I was over the weekend. Yeah, I reckon I really was pretty low on, on Saturday, for example. So we can really see how our well-being can really fluctuate. Um, and that's important to remember because it changes. And when it is lower and we're rating ourselves lower, then we know we've got to take a bit more space to turn up the dial, turn up the volume on that well-being. So let's explore more about the biology of how we feel now with Lucy. Thank you, Katie. Yes, so where do all those emotions actually come from? Well, the limbic region highlighted in red is the part of the brain that we can think of as the air traffic controller. It's focused on incoming threats, monitoring the information that comes from our senses, memories and thoughts. And this even includes memories of scary and unpleasant events. Now, this isn't actually as devious a quality as it sounds. The purpose of this is to protect you from occurrences of similar events in the future. So when it perceives something as a threat, the limbic region is, is responsible for the release of neurotransmitters and hormones whose job it is to move energy around for fight, flight and freeze. So the prefrontal cortex highlighted in blue is the part of the brain that just reasons, thinks and plans. Now, the connection between these two is actually an interesting one. It's what allows our feelings to inform our thoughts and to use thoughts to manage emotions. So the neural connection between them takes about 25 years to fully establish. So I'm about a year to go. But essentially, this link shows that we can shift our feelings based on our thoughts. And that's the, the neuroplasticity of the brain, its ability to shift and change perspectives. So when you're highly stressed or feeling any of the horrible emotions that uh, Katie mentioned on the previous slide, it's usually because your limbic system has taken over and turns on all of the alarm bells. So the prefrontal cortex shuts down, which is why it's harder to make decisions and to think clearly when you're stressed. And things like your vision and hearing, which you might think aren't affected, are partially compromised as the limbic region sends around adrenaline to activate the heart and lungs in response to the perceived threat. So it's really gearing you up to, to just escape whatever it is that, that it perceives is in your way. So as well as this, the stress hormone cortisol is released, which weakens our immune system, slows digestion and breaks down fats and proteins for energy, which probably explains why lots of us comfort eat when, when we're stressed. So the long-term effects include increased blood pressure, cardiovascular problems and more. But it's not all doom and gloom, and it's not actually about trying to avoid all these emotions because we're not actually we're not robots after all. But rather to balance them out, reduce their occurrence, and therefore reduce their effects. So now we're going to have a look at some coping mechanisms for tough times. So when we start noticing that we're slipping into unpleasant ways of being or unpleasant habits, for example, rumination, procrastination or anxiousness, when the limbic region has been activated, it almost feels like we don't have a choice. But we do. We can either deal with these emotions in helpful ways or unhelpful ways. So let's first think about the unhelpful ways. These include blame, procrastination, denial, rumination, poor habits or even just being annoyed at yourself for not feeling amazing all the time. And we're all guilty of these things, but then they're not to be avoided because they do show us where we can improve and develop our reactions and responses. 
So the helpful strategies include acceptance of the present moment, positive self-talk and challenging any self-limiting beliefs. For example, my thoughts are telling me so and so, but is this true? So when we accept and not resist the present moment and challenge our thoughts about it, that's when we're in a better position to make some positive change and get into some, some more positive habits. So we'll go into that a little bit more later, but for now I'll hand back over to Katie, who will explore resilience with you. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, yes. So <clears throat> what is resilience? I'm asking myself and so are a number of other people because really the pandemic has rewritten our understanding of it. So let's look at some different types of resilience to see which type appeals most to you. What they all have in common is that they are different ways of coping with adversity. So the first one I want to look at is recovery resilience. And this is the ability to bounce back or even triumph in the face of adversity. And many of us are likely to have faced times in our lives when we've bounced back from difficult situations. And it can be a really good idea to think back to these experiences and really draw on them at this time. And then in the middle there, we've got adaptive resilience. And you can see here a farm in South Asia where they used to farm chickens. And because of climate change and flooding, they're now actually adapting to uh, farm ducks. So adaptive resilience is about the power to cope with adversity by adapting to challenges or change. And many of us in the first phase of the pandemic, we'll recognise this. Most of us had to do a very quick adaptation in our working lives and our home lives and probably are still having to do that today. So transformative resilience is about our ability to use the challenges and stresses and our failures to catapult us forward. And we may see already how we've needed to adapt as educationalists with technology and how this new understanding may be something to take forward with us into the future. And many of us may be thinking at this stage in the pandemic, it might be time to transform our lives a bit. Stepping back, a lot of people are thinking, hold on a minute, I'm re-evaluating my purpose here, what really matters to me, my values. And I think that's a very healthy thing to do. So you may be getting ready already to make your own changes as a result of the adversity that we have faced. So it's helpful to keep in mind these three types of resilience because they're useful in different situations that we may be called on to focus on our resilience in different ways. Now, something else that can help is to understand that resilience isn't something that you're born with. It's not something that we have or that we don't have. It's something that we do. It's a set of behaviours, a set of habits and ways of operating. And we've all had to do it to do resilience in many parts of our lives to date. So let's do an exercise that takes a look at your unique way of coping with adversity. What do you do? What's your resilience approach and what does it look like? And how do you counter adversity? Awareness for us is really key. Now I'd like you to start by making sure you've got a blank piece of paper and a pen or a pencil handy. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start our boat and waterline exercise. And this was developed by Chris Johnson. And he's got a website link at the end of this um, webinar um, where you can log on to his College of Wellbeing and download some additional free resources. Now, as we know, our resilience fluctuates and bobs up and down like a boat on the water. And this exercise will support you in exploring what impacts your resilience and what helps you to manage adversity. Now, the first thing I'd like you to do is take your piece of paper and draw a little wavy line in the centre. And that represents your waterline of resilience when you're in a really good place. I'd like you to have a think about what does it look like when you're in a really good place and pop your ideas onto the chat for us? That would be very helpful. So have a little think. When I'm in a good place, 
how do I actually feel when I'm in a good place? So I feel a lot more confident, for example. What do you notice about, yeah, relaxed. Yeah, keep them coming. Yeah, we've got them coming, happy, relaxed, confident, safe. That's a good word, motivated, <laughs> calm. Okay, so when you're in a good place, it's good to you know really understand and jovial, absolutely. So tell me a bit more about what you might be thinking when you're in that good place. I suspect you might be thinking more positively. Oh, and in the present, absolutely. Being in the present, that's a good way. And I can do it. That's a really good mantra. Okay, and what do you notice about your behavior? Yeah, probably more confident, transformational, love. These are, that's really great to tap into this. So the, the more that we know our signs, it's easier to manage our well-being and to observe when it's getting low so that we know that we need to turn that volume up. Now, as we progress through this exercise, we're only looking to capture your initial thoughts. And at the end, you're going to have a PDF so that if you want to go into it in more depth, you'll be able to. So let's get started a little bit more now. Now we've got our water level of resilience and we know a little bit about what that looks like. Let's look now at the things that you notice that push you down under that waterline. The things that you notice that sometimes have a more negative effect on your resilience. So if you're feeling in a good place today, and I know one of you at least is feeling a 10, well done. I want you to go back to a time where actually you haven't felt like that and you felt dragged down and observe the things that have had a negative effect on you before. So I'd like you to put, yeah, you're starting to put into the chat. Thank you. These are the things. Look at the things now that actually push us down. Feeling overloaded, not feeling in control. Yeah, deadlines, particularly unrealistic ones. Sudden changes of plans. That's a very interesting one. That's quite preference based. OK, you can see some similarities as well in what people are saying. So these are the things that have a more negative effect on your resilience. Thank you for sharing some of those. OK, interpersonal relationships, financial problems. Yeah, last minute arrangements. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the things that actually you notice that have a possible effect, a positive effect on your resilience. So what are the things that you're doing and that you're being that have, tend to have a positive effect on your resilience? So let's start to look at those. You're already working with me on it. Thank you. Exercise. Faith. Yeah. Being organized. Yeah. Getting a promotion. Meditation. Stretching. Family. OK. Socializing. Look at all these things that you know are holding you up. So, you know, think to yourself, where do you draw your strength from? Gardening, walking in nature. OK, and when you're wound up, how do you steady yourself? Think about that. When you're wound up and you're tense, how do you steady yourself? Somebody here, good night, sleep, singing. We've got some lovely things coming in. So I tend to cope better when I'm taking deep breaths. I'm stepping away from things. Right, this is very enlightened, the things that you're coming up with here. Yeah. OK, and it can help to go back to times where you've been through difficult situations to think of the strategies that you've employed. What were the practical things that you did to keep perspective, to be able to adapt? Yeah, understanding that I'm limited too. What strengths did you draw on in more difficult times? So what do your friends say about you or your family? You might be somebody who's really good at planning and organizing. You might be somebody who's very determined and or very calm. Your friends say you're very calm and that's something that you can bring to the, uh, the difficult times. Or it might be your optimism or your problem solving abilities. OK, and what resources did you call on? 
um, perhaps people resources, other resources. And what insights did you have when you faced difficult times before? What approach sort of helped you most? I've got one that I want to share with you that always um, helps me, and that's to remember that in every adversity, there is the seed or a, of a greater or equivalent good. And I really believe that. And because I believe that, I go searching for it. So, well, I can see some lovely things still coming in on the chat um, uh, um, that you're thinking about that really helps. So now, hopefully, you've been recording some of these things on your piece of paper, and now you've got a picture of your personal resilience approach, the things that push you down, that are special for you, and the things that hold you up. And self-awareness is really key in how we face adversity. What we're aware of, we can control, and what we're unaware of controls us. When we observe that we have a number of downward arrows to contend with and our well-being is dipping, we can check in with ourselves and pay more attention to what we might do to keep our heads above the water. OK, I'm very interested in, in uh, some of the things that you're saying here um, that are really supporting you. So um, some food for thought, some questions that we can ask ourselves when we look at our boat and water line exercise. And the first one is looking at that exercise and what you have in front of you. What practical steps can you take to raise your water level today? What practical steps could you take? Could be the smaller, the better. You know, it could be simply checking in with yourself each day to see where you're at with your resilience and with your well-being. It could be as simple as taking more breaks. It could be as simple as actually I'm going to ask for help a bit more. That is a really good one. Reaching out to other people. OK, and then look at the downward arrows. Which of the downward arrows can you perhaps remove or reduce or find ways to counter? That might be one that you want to share with people that you trust, because quite often they can see that a little bit more. So, you know, when we're looking at those, it might be as simple as doing some of the things that are at the bottom of your diagram that little bit more. It might be protecting your exercise time. It might be reducing your screen time before bed. It might be accepting the things that you can't change. And then are there any upward arrows that you can give more attention to so that they grow stronger? So some of those could be things like spending more time with the family, creating more me time, anything that helps you to switch off and unplug. Now, remember, when you're looking at this exercise, if you want to explore it further, we will be supplying a PDF at the end of this session. So now we're going to be moving on to managing energy levels and troublesome emotions. And I can see that some of you mentioned, yeah, crying your heart out. OK, sometimes finding things stressful. You know, there's some things that you can do to really support yourself. So we're going to be managing your energy levels and troublesome emotions now, which are often some of the main concerns that people have in pushing themselves down. So let's have a little look. Oh, yeah, that's stressing over things that you can't change. We're just coming to that. Well done. Um, so you might have seen this before. This is called a worry tree. And um, here it's a practical thing that we can do to help us manage some troublesome emotions. We can draw ourselves a tree and hang the things that are worrying and concern us on the tree. When we circle the drain with our worries and concerns, they tend to reduce our sleep. Do you find that? You tend to, you know, have them occupying your mind before you go to sleep, preventing you to go to sleep or maybe waking up really too early in the morning. And these troublesome emotions and worries can really drain our energy. And have you noticed how they get bigger when you ruminate on them more? And when I ruminate on my worries more, actually what happens, they, they get bigger and bigger. And by the time I've even blinked an eye, they become, I've catastrophized them. So can you see how we create our own monsters? worrying I worry about worrying and when I worry about worrying it makes me feel anxious 
So I noticed in the chat somebody um, quoted their grandmother, and I'm going to quote mine because my grandmother used to say, Katie, you're getting into a state. And she was right. I was getting into a state, not a very good state. And the state is letting the worries or the automatic negative thoughts, I call them ants, okay, run riot in our brains. And she also used to say to me, you know what, Katie, go to sleep because everything is better in the morning. And I think that's true as well, because then I've got more energy to fight those ants. So to stop the vicious circle, I'd like to invite you now to think about what could be on your branches of your worry tree, the things that are concerning you. Have a think for a moment. When we think about those worries, then we're in a position to think about what we can do to address them. When we put them out and they're in front of us and we've got them out, we can start to see more where the threads are where we can see where the connections are. We can introduce logic and rationale into those emotions. And importantly, we can ask ourselves, is that worry real or imagined? Some of mine haven't even happened yet. And if you're still doing battle with the ants, we can ask ourselves, well, what's the worst that could happen here? What's the worst that can happen? Imagine it and then ask ourselves, how can I make the worst less likely? And to balance things, I can ask myself, what's the best that could happen here? And how can I make that more likely? So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at a model that is a great model to help us get our worries and concerns into perspective. And as somebody mentioned on the chat, the things that we can actually influence and or control. And this is a lovely little model for having a think about this, because one of the tricks with worries and concerns is about discerning and figuring out which we have any influence and control over and which we simply need to accept. And I appreciate it is a journey to acceptance. It doesn't mean we like them, but it can be more healthy for us to accept the things that we don't have any control over. And in a moment, I'm going to give you some examples. But you can see with this diagram, a very simple diagram that you can do yourselves. We can take our worries and our concerns and we can decide which of them are in this red zone, because actually we don't have any control or influence over them. And which of them could are in our influencing zone, this yellow zone, because no matter how small, there is some tiny little influence we can have on them. And which ones are in this central zone here, this green zone? These are the ones that are totally in our gift. These are the things that we can control. We often worry about the things that we can do nothing about. And really, that's futile and a waste of energy. We're much better to be focusing on this yellow area here that we can influence and this green area here, the things that we can control. So let me give you an example of how this might work. A lot of people at the moment, have you noticed, are talking about the government policy, for example, government policy on education and the pandemic and, you know, can get quite quite irate about this but for most of us policies and government policy are not really in our circle of control we have to accept the policies at this time however the whilst the policies are not in a car control we are able to influence how we respond to them so our approach to those policies is in our circle of influence. For example, I know you've all got really creative in how you're working in your schools and colleges and universities to continue to provide a quality education for people, even despite the lockdowns. You've got to get creative using resources like technological resources to deliver quality education interventions. Some of you have had to get creative about how you're working with parents. So those are things that we can influence. Now, an example of something that's within our control, within our gift, could be, we could consider, is our approach to well-being. Because we can decide how we are going to react to what's happening around us, to the adversities that we face, to find our own path. 
So let's look now at more of the things that are within your control to support your well-being right now. And one of the challenges that we face right now at this stage in the pandemic is this feeling tired and feeling exhausted as the pandemic drags on. So we're now going to look at how we can influence and control our own energy levels. So have you noticed, have you noticed that when you're full of energy and you've got your energy reserves are good, have you noticed how much better you manage everything? how much things are easier. You're quicker at completing tasks. You're probably much more positive, more creative, more optimistic, and you probably produce better quality work. I'm more motivated and I've got much more energy for playtime and, you know, the important bits in my life. So that's interesting. So let's look at the little things that can mount up to deplete our energy. And if you look at this lady in this picture, I want you to hazard a guess and put on the chat what unhelpful habits this lady might have fallen into. What are the things she might be doing to deplete her energy? Too much coffee. We can see that in that picture. Too much caffeine intake, well, that'll put her on alert. She won't be able to sleep so well. Overworked, yeah, lack of sleep, possibly the wrong focus. No rest, no switching off, no break. Yeah. What about on the food side? Anything you might notice there? Too much screen time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no unbalanced lifestyle. You know, working early, finishing late doing the same again, no food, yeah, skipping meals, yeah, all of the things, no relaxation, you've got it, okay, back-to-back -back Zoom meetings or whatever you use, okay, so, and so we can see that the coffee and perhaps some of the eating habits are an attempt to try to, to build energy, but it's really serious when our energy is depleted, because have you noticed when your energy is depleted, uh, we can't think, I can't make any decisions. I find it a lot harder to be creative. I am much less productive. I'm less efficient. It's a vicious circle. I'm not effective. I tend to feel down because I'm not winning at anything. And so I think managing our energy is a forgotten priority. And this is an area in which you can really put your own mask on first because without your energy, it's very hard to help others. So, Lucy, can you help us to understand a little bit about how we can manage our energy in these really testing times? Sure. Thank you, Katie. And I think well-being is sometimes thought of as solely emotional and, and mental self-care. But it's good to remind ourselves every so often that well-being is multifaceted, just as we are. And it needs to be thought of as um, separate parts that make up that make up the whole. And one of the reasons well-being is sometimes difficult to maintain is because we tend to focus on one area and then the other slips. So, for example, you or I may have, may have just run a 5K marathon. But really, what's the point if our brain's just sitting back and thinking, well, yeah, but it's not exactly a 10K. And, oh, my God, didn't it take you so long to run it? So when we check in with each of those four areas and find what serves us within them and what doesn't and then try to implement those habits as often as we can maybe not daily at first because you know it is always tricky to merge loads of new habits into one day but starting off slowly and long enough to see the benefits of them, that's when I think we're on to a winner. And so the next couple of slides are an invitation to check in with your spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical bodies. So Katie, we'll start off with um, the body and then we'll move on from there. Okay, um, and as we go through, um, you know, we really want to invite you to self-assess how you're managing your energy levels. Um, and we're going to start with the body. But, you know, in all of these, you're going to be doing things that are working for you and some things that are going well. And then there might be some other areas you want to improve. And how I know that is because I'm looking at the chat and I can see that you are aware of some of the things um, that can be done. You're giving advice to each other, um, some really good advice on things that you can do in some of these areas. So, you know, are you getting enough exercise 
At the start of the pandemic, a lot of us were really into exercise and doing really well. And I would say that for a lot of us, if we're honest, that's dropped off a little bit. And now we tend to log off in the evening, probably too late. And I don't know about you. And then we flop. OK, and we feel too tired to actually do anything. And there's an irony to that, because even if we do just 10 minutes of exercise, dancing with the Hoover to Bruce Springsteen, jogging or exercising to some music, going back to exercise that you've enjoyed in the past, it invigorates us. Do you agree? Lovely. So, <coughs> excuse my voice. What about sleep? Are you getting enough sleep? What about nutrients? And are you taking enough breaks? Okay, Lucy, can you do some work for us on the emotions? Sure, yes. Um, I want to start off by saying that um, I don't think we should aim to be happy all the time. Firstly, because as we all know, that's impossible. And secondly, because there is so much to be gained by going through the cycles of emotions. All of nature shows us that there are cycles to life. And usually these cycles nudge us in the right direction to check in with ourselves and to see if our thoughts, feelings and actions are in alignment with how we want to feel and therefore what we should release and what we should hold on to. So firstly, thinking about questioning and acknowledging our emotions. Sometimes, of course, they are instinctual reactions to the unpleasant and tragic things that happen in all of our lives. And of course, these are really valid, as are all emotions. But sometimes they do come from the conditioned mind, dwelling on the past, present or future, and often telling us a narrative that simply isn't true. So it's helpful to question your inner voice every now and then and ask whether it's coming from a place of truth or a place of ego. Uh, in addition to this toying with the idea that everything is as it should be and everything has happened as it should, even if you don't fully believe it and understanding that we cannot and do not know the bigger picture. And those kinds of ways of thinking about things usually allays any thoughts that we have, any anxious thoughts, and it makes some space for acceptance. And then when we can learn to question, acknowledge and accept what we're feeling, we can then learn to better manage our emotions as opposed to wishing them away. Because as we know, they never will go away, no matter how zen we try to be. So the failure is never that they're there, but rather not noticing them there. And I think when you have that habit in place, it becomes easier to observe your emotions as opposed to identifying with them. I, th I know we've probably heard the word distancing so much, but it really is a case of trying to distance ourselves and not identifying with the thoughts that we have and the feelings that we have around them. So just some analogies that I like to think of uh, with emotions is a tree that is so firmly rooted that any weather, any emotion will eventually pass and nothing would have uprooted that tree. Another maybe a bit funnier uh, analogy is seeing emotions as guests that you're not particularly fond of. So they can pass through your streets. You can be perfectly polite. You can wave hello. You can acknowledge them, but you don't need to invite them into your house for tea. So as mentioned earlier, our thoughts can influence our emotions. And the more you reframe your thoughts, the more you're playing with the brain's neuroplasticity, which is something very useful to do. And we'll go a bit more into that later on. But Katie will discuss the mind with you on the next slide. Yes, the mind. And I can see a lot of people talking about overthinking here yeah. on the chat. You know, that's that's very common to overthink. So it could be good for us to do some sharing about some things that actually we might do that can counter that. So um, perhaps one of them is to really try our best to really keep focused on one thing at a time. It's very important um, that we remove distractions. Some of them can be internal distractions like ruminating, overthinking, for example. Um, and some of them can be external distractions, things like you know, our email notifications or our WhatsApp pinging. And it's interesting because we're like Pavlov's dog then, aren't we? <laughs> I've got to salivate, I've got to open the email, or open the WhatsApp message straight away um, to see what's there. But actually, it's ridiculous because that's a distraction and it's taking our attention away from what we're doing and then we've got to go back, we've got to get back into the thinking. So the brain functions better doing one thing at a time. Also, are you keeping focused 
on the long term things that matter to you in your life. You know, when COVID is done. I think it's very motivating to really think about the things and dream about the things that we want to be doing when this pandemic is over, the important things in our lives. It can really help to just sit down and think about what's important in my life right now and making sure that I'm making time for that. Are you taking digital free breaks? Unplugging can really help us to keep perspective and just create some space to breathe. Otherwise, we're always on. Are you taking a few moments each day to switch off your mind, to do those walks in nature, to focus on some things that you can get absorbed in, like doing puzzles or knitting or cooking or whatever it might be? Yeah, and I can see here that coming into the chat, some little tips here. See, meditation is a very good way of practicing working with our thoughts and feelings. And that can certainly be a way of stopping the overthinking. OK, Lucy, can you tell us a little bit more about the spiritual side? Yes, sure. So, yeah, looking at the spiritual side of things and, and the word spiritual can mean many things to many people. And I think it sometimes has the reputation, depending on what angle you're looking at it, as being a little wishy-washy or hocus-pocus. But ultimately, it's just about connecting with yourself and maybe even connecting to the idea that there is something bigger than us. Now, the activities I've chosen to discuss are proven to provide psychological and biological benefits. So not only can they alleviate anxiety and other low moods that we feel, especially during turbulent times, but they also positively impact your mind and your body. So it's a real win-win. So first, let's look at the default mode network and what it does. So what is actually meant by presence? Surely all of us are present all of the time just by the fact that we're here. But our attention is so divided that often we're not. The default mode network, which you can see in the first image, is responsible for mind wandering. And it's called the default network because it's activated when we're not focused on a task. So when we are not focused on the present moment and dwelling on the past or future, neuroimaging shows that the network is most active and this activity is linked with the lower levels of happiness and studies in the field of neuroscience have shown that we mind wonder 46.9 percent of the time so that's a lot of time to potentially be unhappy so what can be done about it well First of all, let's look at meditation. The direct link, so a few people have mentioned meditation, which is great, so you might already have that in your routine. But the direct link between meditation and the default network is not just that it's shown to activate other more helpful regions of the brain, but also that it effectively tells the network to cool off. As well as this, it changes your thinking pattern throughout your daily life to curb distraction and mind wandering. So if you practice just five minutes in the morning, the effects will continue to show throughout the day. Uh, there are many types of meditation and definitions of it, but for me, it means just sitting down in a comfortable and quiet space and just focusing on my breathing, even if it's just, you know, five minutes, 20 minutes is my maximum. I tend to get bored after that. But, you know, you could go longer and you don't need anything fancy. You don't need any yoga mats. You don't even need a pillow. It's just, you know, being comfortable and just noticing your breath. But the benefits are huge. Uh, it releases an amino acid called GABA. So this works as a neurotransmitter in our brains and is related to serotonin and feelings of calm and tranquility. So what else does meditation actually do? Well, it activates the back part of the brain and encourages the neuro pathways to make their way to the frontal lobe where rewiring occurs. And that's how we're all capable of shifting perspectives and of improving mindset. And this is why meditation is so popular among corporate giants and football teams because it kind of gets them in the zone. And as the rewiring happens, we get into the habit of observing rather than reacting. So a few of the, the comments that came through were about overthinking. And the more you kind of train your brain to do this stuff and to quieten it as much as you can, that's when you kind of get a bit more control back. So let's look at a little bit of proof. Um, a study by Harvard University found that those who meditated had less gray matter in the amygdala, which you can see in the second image, the region of the brain that controls the release of stress hormones, and more gray matter in the hippocampus and cerebellum, which contributes to improved coordination, memory, and emotional regulation, which we all seem to you know, need, especially during turbulent times. 
Other long-term benefits include strengthening of the prefrontal cortex and parietal lobes, which are responsible for emotion and attention control too, and anticipation of events and impulse control. A separate study by Yale University measured cognitive activity using an fMRI scanner and took a look at the most effective meditation. So there are tons that, that could work for you, but the top three um, are the loving kindness meditations. So they are also known as meta meditations. And this involves just some positive intentions for yourself and hoping for the same positive intentions for others and just cultivating a sense of compassion for yourself and realizing that that you were once a child and, and kind of viewing yourself with eyes of love as opposed to just, you know, an adult who, you know, <laughs> has just grown up and is just plonked onto the earth that way. So really realizing that are you treating yourself in the same way as you would your pet, which sounds funny, but it's true. Um, you're also a living thing. So really questioning how we talk to ourselves and, and how we see things. Secondly, the breathing meditation. Now, this just involves, as you might have guessed, focusing on your breath in and out, and also the noticing thoughts meditation, which again, as you might have guessed, is just about noticing your thoughts and not judging them when you notice that they, they keep coming in. You're thinking, I'm meditating and I'm not meant to be thinking thoughts, <laughs> but just kind of taking it as it comes and not being too annoyed at yourself for that. So very linked to the act of meditation is yoga. It carries with it many of the benefits that meditation does. And we all know that any type of movement is good for us. And practicing just a five minute stretch in the morning from YouTube can positively impact your entire day. So um, I know a few of you are exercising already, uh, made, and a few of you mentioned yoga too. So that's great. Um, and now just moving on to journaling. Uh, which brings with it a heap of its own benefits, really. And in any form it may be, whether that's writing, positive affirmations, working through your thoughts or setting intentions for the future, it provides so many benefits. And among these are boosting your mood, enhancing your sense of well-being, reducing symptoms of depression, improving working memory. So if you tend to forget things a lot, this could be for you. Uh, improves physical symptoms of conditions such as asthma and, and rheumatoid arthritis. And it also reduces intrusive thoughts and increases emotional reg regulation. So lots of the things that we've mentioned, uh, it seems to provide quite a bit of uh, benefits for. So as humans, I think we, are, we all know we're created to, to process toxins like the liver and the kidney. Our brains have the capacity to process toxins too. And I really believe that the activities mentioned on this slide are integral in processing difficult experiences and toxic thoughts and toxic ways of beings. And while it's impossible to feel great, be great and do great all the time, it is possible possible to balance these out and uh, just to move forward in a bit more of a positive way. And then once you're in that position, you can start to build on the positive habits uh, that serve you. So these things can be preventative care or rescue remedies, whichever you prefer and whenever you need them. So I'll now hand over to Katie for some final words and a look at some deeper dive resources. Mm. Okay, well, just before we do, I think we have got time to take a few questions. And there's a couple of things that have come up on the chat that I think it would be really, really good to look at. So some people feeling quite overwhelmed. And one very, thank you very much for putting, how mm. does one put boundaries in place when the workload is too much? OK, too many learners need support. Parents aren't involved and more and more demands are made on educators. And I mean, that's a really real situation. Um, and, you know, really sense your your pain there and feeling overwhelmed. I would feel overwhelmed, too. And I think you're onto something about the first thing you've put there about how does one put boundaries in place? And, you know, thank you for reaching out on the chat with that. And I'd like the, the, the people that are on this webinar to really think, you know, how do you put boundaries in place? You know, let's, let's share some ideas on this. Um, one person has put, maybe we need to learn to set limits with ourselves and impose them on others. And that would require some assertive communication. That would, you know, that it's good to, you know, to... Yeah 
really manage our boundaries by using assertive conversations and communication with others so that people do understand that we've got needs as well and of course we want to um, deal with uh, others legitimate needs but not at the expense of our own and you know because otherwise we're not putting our mask on first and we're not helping so let's have a little look is anybody saying anything else here that you know yeah we need to have boundaries so part of the thing is deciding what those boundaries might look like and also accepting that we cannot do everything we just can't do everything you know yeah. and we, we've got to look after ourselves very much first okay so we're hoping um, that you've been able to review from this webinar all the things that you're already doing to support your well-being and feel encouraged to grow them. Um, maybe feel encouraged to start doing something you haven't tried before or decided you really want to improve some things around your well-being and feel it's time to, to take stock. So whatever approach you take, remember it's one little step at a time. Little healthy well-being habits are easier to bed in and seed now so that we can watch them glow and flourish in the coming months. OK, so we've got some resources um, that uh, now that um, Lucy would like to uh, finish off and wrap up and discuss. Lucy. Thank you, Casey. Yes, yeah, so these that you'll find uh, the resources all on the slides emailed to you. And they're just a combination of things that Katie and I have thought would be most useful, uh, just kind of summing up the themes that we've spoken about. Um, just before I close, I saw a question come up about um, how to get yourself out of a rut. And I think with that question, I think it's so relatable because even if you've nail down all of the habits that that you you, you really want to, to start practicing you know there does come days as you know that, that, that there do come days that you're just in that position where you think oh why do i feel like this or oh i just you know i meditated this morning so <laughs> why am i so annoyed at this but really i think the first step when you're in that position is the acceptance of okay i feel this way I uh, I don't need to think about it too much unless the situation requires thought. And then once you once you've kind of realised, okay, I feel this way. What can I do about it? What's going to make me feel better? Is it journaling or is it just switching on my favourite program on Netflix? Is it you know different things work for different people and also different things at different times. So I think the first step is acceptance, and then you're in that position to make positive change because I think when you're um, annoyed at yourself for feeling that way that's when nothing really productive can come out of it so I hope that's helpful um, but yeah in general thank you very much for joining our webinar which we, we hope you found useful well-being is a tricky one it's not something we can I, achieve but something that's useful to be mindful of as we navigate the highs and lows that are such an inevitable part of our existence but navigating turbulent times becomes a little less daunting when we know what serves us and what doesn't and um, that's when we're in a better position to weather any storms that come our way and often we know exactly what we need to do to bring some balance back into ourselves we just need to really lean in and listen and ultimately all we can really do is our best because we are only human after all so as mentioned here are the, the deeper dive resources which you can follow onto on the internet and uh, but if you do have any questions or comments please feel free to reach out to us using the contact details on the next slide um, so once again thanks for being with us today we hope you take care and we wish you all the very best perfect thank you so much to katie and lucy for a fantastic session uh, they've been delivering this session um, a number of times today and each time i am listening i feel like i'm learning something more than i did the previous time so I really appreciate the content and I can tell from the feedback that the attendees have really enjoyed the session. So thank you again. And as Lucy said, if you would like to get in contact with us, please do email us. The PowerPoint presentation and the webinar recording will be sent by email within two weeks and your CPD certificate will be automatically available as soon as the session ends today. So just to say thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you in an upcoming session soon. Take care for now and stay safe. Bye. Bye, everybody.